Hello Space Fans, welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, scientists from the LIGO collaboration announced they've seen a second gravitational wave event and a gluttonous star with a hilarious name may hold clues to planet formation and an update on ESA's ExoMars mission to the Red Planet. Well, space fans, it is official. We now live in the age of gravitational wave astronomy. This week, it was announced that the LIGO observatories in Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana have detected a second gravitational wave signal from another pair of orbiting black holes that merged. The event, called GW151226, was seen on December 26th, and they're calling it the Boxing Day event. This detection was identified within minutes of the event passing the detectors, and careful data analysis shows that the signal came from two black holes merging some 1.4 billion light years away. Now, this is coincidentally roughly the same distance of the first detection from the September 2015th event that was announced in February. So here is what we know. The gravitational wave arrived at the two detectors at almost the same time, indicating that the source was located somewhere in a ring of sky about midway between the two detectors. The two merging black holes in the Boxing Day event were less massive, they're 14 and 8 times the mass of our Sun, than those that were observed in the first detection, which were 36 and 29 times the mass of the Sun. And while this made the signal weaker, when those lighter black holes merged, their signal shifted into the higher frequencies, bringing it into LIGO's sensitive band earlier into the merger than was the September event. Now remember last week I told you that LIGO can only see higher frequency gravitational waves of around 100 Hz and higher. Last but not least, the Boxing Day event revealed that one of the initial black holes was spinning like a top. And this was a first for LIGO to be able to see this with such confidence. A spinning black hole suggests that this object has a very different history. For example, maybe it sucked in mass from a companion star before or after collapsing from a star to form a black hole and getting spun up in the process. So this second signal, which came just three months after the first one, was a little bit different. The black holes were about as far away, but because they were lighter, it had a much weaker signal. So because LIGO was on the ground and it's subject to a lot of noise from other places on the Earth, they had to be more careful to look for airplanes, lightning strikes, seismic noises, people dropping hammers, all the things that could go wrong before they could confirm this particular event. Now, although they are trickier to distinguish from all the background noise of the Earth, gravitational waves produced by weaker collisions do have one advantage when it comes to detection. They move more slowly. It took the space-time ripple on December 26th a full second to pass through LIGO's detectors, as opposed to the previous signal, which coursed through our planet in just a fraction of that time. So with just two events, LIGO has already yielded important insights into the size distribution of black holes and the frequency of mergers. Before the first detection, nobody was sure the 30 solar mass black holes even existed. The second event is also rather exceptional compared with the black holes humans have identified via X-ray observations, which are all in the range of several solar masses. Every subsequent event will constrain all the theories even further. So gravitational waves also offer a first-of-its-kind tool for observing the behavior of cosmic objects that don't emit any light. They have such a weak interaction with everything that they come in a straight line from their source right to us. And because of this, we can see the deep interior motion of objects like black holes and neutron stars in a way that we can't with electromagnetic radiation. So what's next? Well, LIGO's first observational run ended last January, and the experiment is currently undergoing a lot more improvements. And it's interesting to note that these two events were detected with the LIGO instruments operating at only about 40 to 45 percent sensitivity. They can do much better, so they're upgrading right now. Now the next run is slated to begin this fall, and with the slightly better sensitivity, it'll be able to listen for gravitational waves over a much broader area of space. Now, here's, here's something else that's really cool, and you may not know this, and this kind of gets us to the part about living in the age of gravitational wave astronomy. There is another observatory called Advanced Virgo, which is the European Gravitational Observatory's souped-up detector that's operating in Italy and France, and it's expected to come online later this year with a sensitivity that's close to that of LIGO. And adding another detector halfway around the world will allow scientists to better localize the source of gravitational waves in the sky. 
Now this helps astronomers because with three observational points thousands of kilometers apart, triangulation in the sky is much more precise, from a few hundred square degrees to just tens of square degrees. And that means in the future astronomers might be able to turn their telescopes in the direction of a gravitational wave signal and actually pinpoint the source. And finally there's another observatory opening in Japan called the Kamioka Gravitational Wave Detector or CAGRA and that is expected to begin operations in 2018. So get out your surfboards folks and get ready to ride the waves of space time. There are exciting times ahead. Next. All right, I admit to being a little sophomoric here about this story because when I first read it I really couldn't stop laughing about it. So there's this star called FU Orionis. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm, I'm a 12 year old. Uh, but in 1936, this star was observed gobbling up material from its surrounding disk of gas and dust with a sudden voraciousness. During a three month binge, as matter turned into energy, the star became 100 times brighter, heating the disk around it to a temperature of up to 6600 degrees Celsius or 7000 Kelvin. FU Orionis is still devouring gas to this day although not as quickly. So since 1936, astronomers have been observing FU Orionis in visible light, which is about 1500 light years away from Earth in the constellation Orion. And these observations have shown astronomers that the star's extreme brightness began slowly fading after its 1936 event. Now recently, astronomers wanted to know if the star was still gorging on the surrounding disk and they pointed SOFIA at it, which is an infrared observatory mounted in a jumbo jet and flown in the stratosphere to reduce the effects of the atmosphere on the infrared observations. So the team compared the data obtained in 2016 from SOFIA to observations made for, with the Spitzer Space Telescope back in 2004. SOFIA happens to take observations at wavelengths that Spitzer can no longer perform. By combining data from the two telescopes collected over a 12 year period, they were able to gain a unique perspective on the star's behavior over time. Using these infrared observations and all the other historical visible light data taken since 1936, researchers found that FU Orionis had continued its ravenous snacking after the initial brightening event. The star had eaten the equivalent of 18 Jupiters in the last 80 years. Now these recent measurements provided by SOFIA show that the total amount of visible and infrared light energy coming out of the FU Orionis system had decreased by about 13% over the 12 years since the Spitzer observations. And researchers determined that this decrease is caused by dimming of the star at short infrared wavelengths but not at longer wavelengths. And that means up to 13% of the hottest material of the disk had disappeared while the colder material had stayed intact. Now astronomers predict that FU Orionis will run out of hot material to consume within the next few hundred years. At that point the star will return to the state it was in before the dramatic 1936 brightening event. And scientists aren't sure what the star was like before or what set off the feeding frenzy in the first place. So what does this event tell us about planet formation? Well, if our sun had a brightening event like FU Orionis did in 1936, this could explain why certain elements are more abundant on Mars than on the Earth. A sudden 100-fold brightening would have altered the chemical composition of material close to the star, but not so much from the material farther from it. And because Mars formed farther from the sun, its component material would not have heated up as much as Earth was. So FU Orionis is only a few hundred thousand years old. It's a baby in the typical lifespan of a star. The 80 years of brightening and fading since 1936 represents only a tiny fraction of the star's life so far, but these changes happen to occur at a time when astronomers could observe, which was really cool. <laughs> Now what astronomers want to do next is point the incredible infrared capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope at FU Orionis when it launches in October of 2018 to see what, what more they can learn about this early life of a sun-like star. And I'll let you know. And finally, on June 13th, the European Space Agency ExoMars spacecraft sent back its first image of its destination, the Red Planet. 
This first light image from the spacecraft was taken when it was 41 million kilometers away from Mars. And while there isn't all that much detail yet because of the distance, this is an important milestone for the mission because this shows that the camera seems to be well focused and that the signal levels are close to what it's predicted to perform at. And this is a relief because remember I told you in SFN 157 that there appeared to be some debris following the spacecraft after the launch on March 14th by a Roscosmos Breeze Am rocket. And the debris was spotted by a ground observatory in Brazil, and there was some speculation at the time that something might have happened to the rocket when it attempted to veer away from the ExoMar spacecraft. But the Russian space agency reported that they saw no evidence that anything went wrong. Now, no one was going to know for sure, though, until the mission team started turning on and working out the cameras and the payload. So this instrument is positive because it seems to confirm that there isn't anything wrong with the instruments on board and the mission team will continue to take data and analyze it during the remaining four month trip before it gets to Mars. ExoMars is scheduled to arrive at the Red Planet on the 19th of October and on the same day the Schiaparelli lander will also make its descent. And the lander is a proof of concept craft designed to demonstrate key technologies needed for landing. And the orbiter and its suite of four instruments are going to sniff out rare ga gases in the atmosphere. And of particular interest to planetary astronomers is methane, or methane as they say in the UK, which could point to active geological or biological processes on the planet. The camera will be used to study geological features, including those that might be related to gas sources, such as volcanoes. The orbiter's other scientific instruments have also been undergoing checks this week, and next month, on July 28th, the spacecraft will perform a major course correction, which will line it up for Mars. I'll keep you posted. Well, that's it for this week, space fans. I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters, notably Ken Kilgore this week for his generous support. Ken, your SFN mug is on the way. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Have detected, detected, why do I do that every time? <laughs> detected.